signing these. So I'll okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So do I uh, do I just say that was your um, I would like you to still read it so it's cut in for you know just say okay. she's not feeling well so she can be with us today but we'll have a deliver to her. Okay. But read what I wrote okay. for you there. Okay. I fly out tomorrow at seven PM. I think I realized my bar was causing some bugs and we're out tomorrow and then on the only third floor that doesn't have to sell you or stay Oh really? Um, yeah, we have. Uh, yes, you're good to go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. For. Uh, Barb's not here. Barb's not here. Okay. Okay. Come on. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's uh, it's noon now. A little bit after, and that, so I'm going to uh, call this meeting to order. Um, the blessing and land acknowledgement, uh, Councillor Koch. As we gather, we recognize that we are on Treaty Three lands, which are steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nation and Métis people today. We continue to be thankful for the partnerships with Indigenous people. We give thanks for the many blessings we enjoy in the city of Kenora. We seek wisdom in our minds, clearness in our thinking, truth in our speaking, and always love in our hearts, so that we may try always to unite the citizens of Kenora. Let these principles guide us in our decision making. Thank you. Uh, item number three, public information notices as required under uh, bylaw, uh, notice bylaw number 144-2007. Uh, the public is advised of the council's intention to adopt the following at today's meeting. Establish the 2023 meeting calendar and amend the procedural bylaw. Adopt a new public notice bylaw. Item number four, declaration of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Uh, if there's any uh, member of council uh, has any declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof pertaining to any items as follows on today's agenda or from a previous meeting, from the meeting at which a member was not in attendance. Councillor Clark. Uh, Your Worship, I will declare a conflict of interest on item number eight, appointment to the Northwestern Health and Board of Health as it relates to my employment. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, moving uh, on to item number five, uh, resolution number one. Thank you, Your Worship. I move resolution number one, and it's seconded by Councillor uh, Moncrief that the following minutes of the Council of the City of Kenora be adopted as circulated. The inaugural meeting of Council on November 15th, 2022, and the special Council meeting November 16th, 2022. All those in favour? Thank you. Uh, moving on to item number six, presentations, deputations. Uh, so we have uh, four today. Uh, the first one is a citizen's recognition award. Um, and unfortunately, the individual is not feeling well and wasn't able to attend. Um, so uh, I have some words to read here. And we have uh, a couple of gifts and a uh, uh, recognition plaque for it, which we will get to her at uh, some point in time in the near future. So this is for uh, Celine Alcock, and it's a Citizen a Recognition Award. Uh, Celine has been nominated uh, for one of our Citizen Recognition Awards, and we are pleased to present this award uh, to her for her valuable contributions in our community as a volunteer. Celine opened the Kenora Cat Shelter and for many years has opened her home to hundreds of cats who need a temporary or permanent home. <coughs> Celine provides this important service in our community free of charge and graciously collects donations and volunteers to, ass to assist her. Without this very important service, many of these animals uh, would not have somewhere safe to go. She works hard to help finding love and permanent homes for all of her foster cats. Thank you, Celine, on behalf of Council uh, for the many years of service uh, to your, our community caring for these animals. You are a true city, uh, city of Kenora distinguished volunteer. Uh, happy holidays to you and your family. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, um, moving on uh, through the presentations and deputations. Uh, the next item up is strategic plan, working plan, and we have a, a blueprint uh, presentation uh, on the screen. Good, mo uh, good afternoon. Hmm. Oh. One minute. Oh. <coughs> Just give us one sec, Michelle. We're just working on the sound. Can you hear us now, Michelle? We sure I can. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we, we can. Uh, so, Michelle, uh, thanks for uh, attending virtually, and uh, the floor is yours. Great. Well, first I just want to say how, how good it is to be with you all. I'm, uh, I'm joining you today from Tree One Territory in Winnipeg. And, uh, and I'm really happy to be with you. Um, uh, Kyle asked me to come in and speak with you today just briefly to give you a bit of an, an introduction to say hello. My name is Michelle Cooley. I'm the principal of Blueprint Inc. Uh, and we are a strategy and engagement firm. And, and I'll share maybe just a bit about our experience um, and expertise in just a moment. But I thought today what might be helpful is uh, if I briefly do a bit of an introduction so you know uh, who you'll be working with and, uh, over the next uh, month and a bit. Uh, do a, a review of the work plan that we have ahead and uh, why we put this together in this approach and then have a chance if you have any questions or, or, or want to chat further. That will be keying up the, the work we'll be doing ahead. So um, with that, again, my name is uh, Michelle. I'm the principal of Blueprint. Uh, we're a team of about uh, 10 uh, consultants, facilitators, and we work really deeply in connecting strategic planning and engagement. Uh, and we do that work because we believe that uh, in order for strategy, strategic plans to be effective, you actually have to have the engagement, the buy-in of the folks uh, that need to be leading them, that need to be implementing them, uh, and that are affected by them. So that's guided our work for, for over a decade. We've been working in municipal context for over a decade, and that's uh, in a few different areas. Uh, first and foremost, it's in engagement, and collaboration with council, with administration, and with community on challenging projects. Uh, it's also been in strategic planning and priority setting. And we do that work with large, mid-size, and small local governments um, at a department level within uh, within those groups and with agencies. So uh, you know that ranges everywhere from uh, here in Manitoba, for example, with the city of Winnipeg. Uh, with uh, municipalities in that metro region, uh, with groups like uh, Portage, the mid-sized cities here. Um, it also includes work with First Nations communities on strategic planning. Uh, and then I think specific to some of the work you're looking at in Kenora, uh, we also work a lot with agencies and so groups like downtown biz associations, uh, groups that really need to work with and aligned uh, to the, uh, the work of their local government partners. So we understand that context as well. And uh, beyond the municipal folks we work with, um, we do work with other levels of government, community institutions, and industry. So we bring to the work uh, that we do with municipalities a really 360 view of the partners you have to work with for success in, uh, in moving forward on your priorities at a community level. Um, so this is our first time uh, working alongside the city of Kenora, and it's a real privilege, uh, frankly, to do that. Um, and although it's the first time working with uh, Kenora, we certainly work frequently with councils at the beginning of their new, their new term. So we know very well the energy and excitement that there is to build on, how important uh, maintaining momentum is, uh, but also uh, over time, we've really observed that uh, the councils that take the time to build context uh, before they, they move into priority setting um, have the most success. So the process we put together here is really focused on harnessing both of those things. So you know what we're what our I guess role is here uh, is to help council work as a group to build some consensus around priorities for the term, how you'll work together uh, with each other with the public service. And community to achieve them. 
And, you know, we're certainly cognizant that the city already has a strategic plan. This isn't intended to duplicate that or any of the work done in, in numerous other plans and studies. Uh, but this process is about adding focus to the next four years and uh, identifying the targeted results that, that this uh, council wants to work on. So uh, in terms of the team that's working alongside you, uh, I'll be a little bit in the background. Uh, Pam Graham is the team member uh, from Blueprint who will be uh, in session with you in January and be working uh, most closely with you on this process. She couldn't be here today. She's facilitating another priority setting session today. So um, I'm here in her place. Uh, and in addition to Pam and myself, uh, we do have an analyst working behind the scenes compiling some of the uh, data that you'll be working on uh, shortly. And so I'll speak now to sort of what the, what the process looks like over the next uh, month and a half. So uh, I know Council has been working through some deep education sessions and briefings with uh, the senior administration, um, which is very helpful. We're going to ask you to do a bit of a, a pre-work, a homework assignment before we move into a session, a priority setting session later in January. Um, and again, in our experience, uh, in order for an in-person session to be as effective and focused and productive as possible, uh, we have to figure out what the important work is to do before we actually get in the room. So that will be the focus of uh, some pre-work. So there, is, there are four steps in this process. The first is uh, one you'll see shortly after this uh, meeting today. Uh, we'll be giving you a bit of a, an assignment uh, just to reflect essentially on uh, the things that came up during campaign, uh, things that came up during education sessions with the senior administration, um, the items you want to sort of put on the table and put in play when we get together as a group. So we'll ask you to uh, identify some of the priorities, commitments, what you heard from the campaign at a high level and, and very specifically as well. Um, I'll ask you to reflect on the council education sessions, the current strategic plans, the documents you've reviewed, and really articulate what you saw in those documents that is very clearly a priority for this term, and any gaps that you saw. Um, we'll also ask you to reflect on what you want to have come out of this process, uh, so that where we actually get to on that priority setting becomes something that's meaningful uh, for, for this council uh, and for community as you move forward. So I ask you to, to do that work in the reflection uh, by January 6th. We will take a week to analyze those results and then we'll conduct some one-on-one -on -one interviews with members of council to do a bit of a briefing on that analysis and ask you any questions we have to clarify uh, what we learned from you. And between those two steps, we'll have what we need to tee up the council session uh, on January 26th. And that session uh, will have a firm starting point thanks to the pre-work we'll be doing to generate uh, priorities and identify targeted results. And we'll capture that in a fairly concise summary. Um, we're thinking of that as a team charter document that really sets out the priorities and how you'll work together to achieve them. Then we'll come back to you uh, at, I think it's February 5th or 6th, uh, early February, um, to review those results uh, and so that council can take a look at them sober second thought and uh, and look at what you want to adopt in the plan moving forward. And that will be the, the bulk of our work with Council, but I want to really reiterate that uh, uh, this session, the document we produce, won't be a one and done. Uh, ultimately, you as a group, a group will decide how you want to, to use that. Uh, and in session, we'll talk a, a little bit more about that. But certainly, it should be something that uh, is shared with administration, so they can look at the priorities you've set, identify potential implications and decisions that council will have to make with regards to future budgets, department level priorities, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, it's something that should be shared with community so they can see and understand uh, this council's vision for the term, uh, what results you're targeting. Uh, you can provide updates on the status of those things and also for citizens to understand the, the implications. I mean, uh, as a council, um, you know, you're certainly dealing with pressing priorities, but if everything is a, is a 10, then, then nothing is a 10, so to speak. So uh, there are trade-offs when you're prioritizing work in some areas, um, there are implications. So it's an important tool for community to understand what's, 
what's in view and what some of the implications may be as well. And then of course, for yourselves referenced in, in council meetings and in briefings, this should really help guide you uh, beyond uh, the work we do, uh, certainly in January and February. So that's a, a very quick overview of um, Blueprint, what we do, our experience, um, the process we have uh, in place to try to capitalize on the momentum and, and the thinking you're already doing with some homework and bringing that into a session in January, uh, how we're suggesting that plan can be used, some food for thought, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, Council, any questions from Michelle? Uh, Councilor Bernie. Sure. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for that uh, information. Um, I guess my question is, does Blueprint have any experience doing uh, community safety and well-being planning? Community safety and well-being planning? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's certainly a policy area that we that we do have experience in. Um, we work on a lot of high profile, complex, challenging projects, whether they're policy related or um, or capital projects. I'm certainly not going to suggest we're experts in community safety uh, by any stretch. That's not our area of expertise, but we certainly understand uh, the issues, the dynamics at play uh, because they they come up in the work we do all the time. You know, in the work we do, I don't think there's a municipality um, in Canada that isn't dealing with some of those issues right now. So there's certainly things we we've, we've seen and understand um, and understand that context. Okay, yeah, I was just when you were talking about your priority setting and your engagement, strategic planning. That's all part of community safety and well-being planning. And I, I just, I, you know, I'm just wondering if there was an overlap or if that's something that you did routinely. But thanks, thanks for the answer. Sure. Uh, Councillor Moncrief. Hi, Michelle. I'm just wondering when we can expect to get that information, uh, the questionnaire that you're looking for answers by January 6th. Yeah, we've got a, a, a draft together. I wanted to have a chance to connect with council today before we set that over, but I think you can expect to see a draft tomorrow uh, so that you can spend some time working on that. And again, it, it's not designed to be um, you know, a brand new exercise for you, but just an opportunity to capture the, the reflections and thoughts you're already having. Um, it creates a firmer starting point for us in preparing for the session. Any other questions of council? No? Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time, Michelle, and we look forward to uh, receiving our uh, homework assignment. For sure. And I just want to say, um, you know, to everybody in the room, uh, wishing you the best this time of year. I know we all have uh, lots on the go, professionally and personally, and uh, and certainly thinking of all of you in Kamara. Take care. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Right. Okay. Yeah. So next on the agenda, uh, Jane Benoit, uh, Summer Family Theater 2023. That's me. That's you.
All right. Do you want to just uh, tell me when to advance your screen? That'll work easier over here. Oh, sure. Okay. Cool. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Second, hello. There we go. The, warm, the room is a little warmer. Uh, my name is Jade Benoit. I am from Kenora, Ontario. Uh, I'm a Kuwait girl, born and raised. Woo. Uh, I, Woo. Woo. Uh, I actually live in Calgary now, but uh, Kenora is home to me during the Christmas holidays and the summers, am I right? Um, and I'm here to talk about my uh, theater arts collective here now. Fancy shirts. Ooh. Uh, this is our beautiful logo. If you can bridge, uh, you may advance. Okay. Nice. So this is who we are. We are these two artists. Some bullet points. Uh, I said most of them. Um, I went to Mount Royal University. I graduated with a theater diploma uh, certificate. Uh, and this is my friend Fatima Alhamidam Miller. She is out of St. Thomas, currently living in Toronto. Uh, we are both artists. Actors, directors, producers, we work on crews for TV shows, movies, we do a little bit of everything. Uh, we nanny, what else do we do? Uh, yeah, we uh, have a lot of experience between both of us, about 15 years of art. Wow, fascinating. Uh, you may advance. Thank you, Heather, nailing it. So, who is here now? We are a collective of creators who are committed in devising comedic theater for young audiences. Our goal is to take theater to communities underserved by the arts and provide free, accessible outdoor shows. That's us. You may advance. Thank you. Why we exist? We see a need for entertainment in Canadian small towns. We want to engage young people through stories set in their own communities and bring people together through laughter and shared experience. Here now is an inclusive collective and believe theater is for everyone and everybody. I was here for four months during 2021. Uh, both my sisters were pregnant, had their babies a day apart. Really weird. Um, and I thought, what could I do with my set of skills to come back to Kenora to give back? That's how this was created. You may advance. Thank you very much. Why theater for young audiences? Theater has the power to inspire, to teach, encourage imagination, and to provide a space for kids to be seen and heard. Over COVID, I did have the luxury of helping Miss Benoit, my sister, who is a kindergarten teacher, uh, now Mrs. Handy, a very strange switch, uh, to come into our kindergarten classes over Zoom and to be a part of those classes. Very strange to, to teach kindergarten over Zoom. Um, and that's kind of how this ball got rolling. I wanted to see how can we bring back the magic, bring back in shared experiences in the room, in the theater. You may advance. This was our program that we did the last one this summer. Uh, so we, uh, we actually pitched it around to a few people in Kenora, and with the help of Firefly and the full support from Darsha Curtis, they gave us a seed grant to be able to come here to put together a little program that we had did get to do. So we created a new 30 minute interactive show each week for a total of two weeks. We did 10 shows in 14 days. <sighs> Would not recommend it again, <laughs> but it was great, very successful. Uh, our stories were about Kenora and the major landmarks. So our first show was about uh, Husky the Musky. It had this beautiful, amazing cardboard fish, uh, and it was about land and water preservation. And our second show was about camping around Russian River, Anishinaabe Park, um, and trying to, you know, be present, get off the electronics. You may advance, thank you very much. So, this was some of our experiences. Uh, these are the 10 shows we were exhausted. So, uh, PJP actually invited us for their summer learning program. They were our very first show of about 35 kids. Very fun, very interactive. They were right there, part of the show. Uh, then we did it at the Splash Park with the help of Casey Pica. We got some sweet permits because it was free. She let us go in and have a great time. Anishinaabe Park, we actually got to perform uh, some evening shows there for some of the campers and some other local residents. Uh, we were part of Loex Art Fest, which was very fun, very cool. We performed the Friday and the Saturday. Uh, as part of a, a fun deal with Firefly, they wanted us to reach out to some of the other communities. So we were fortunate to go to Red Lake <coughs> and to Lookout, where we put on two days of uh, three hour presentation. So we did a puppet building with the kids. They got to do a puppet parade around the community and then we did a show for them. Uh, and then we performed two shows at Harbor Fest as well. You may advance. These were some of our beautiful posters that we made ourselves to try and get uh, 
the children excited about uh, you know, fun colors and excitement? You may advance. So, local supporting locals. This was very important to us. We did not want to fly in and shop in Winnipeg. We came here. We wanted to spend all of our awesome money in town. So we did some guerrilla advertising at the uh, farmer's market, also the open air market. We walked around, handed out postcards with some helium balloons. We were a huge hit. Are you sure? Uh, Hoopla Island saw what we were doing at the Splash Park. They gave us some free passes for families. So uh, we got to use that in our advertising campaign, which was really helpful. Same with Restaurante, obviously Firefly. We printed all of our posters, our ads, everything at Wilson's. Standard Insurance, shout out to Nick Handy. Uh, he was very helpful as well in helping us secure insurance, keeping everybody safe. Sunset Creations, they made our awesome shirts for us. Uh, John Handy, uh, <laughs> he was our volunteer told sound guy who <laughs> really helped us with everything with sound. I didn't know he needed a monitor. He, it, he was a huge help. We could not have done it without him. And yeah, we got everything for costumes, supplies, everything that we could in town. So how did we do this? Well, Facebook and Instagram, very helpful. Uh, our beautiful posters did have QR codes, so they did just direct patrons right to our Facebook and Instagram sites. Uh, radio advertising, Kimmy LaDuke, amazing woman. Uh, she got us in there, did some free ads for us, as well as when we were performing at Lowex Arts Fest, she made sure to find us and give us a little bit of uh, airtime. Postering, we went literally everywhere, hotels, marinas, libraries, we handed out to people, it was a contest amongst us who could get rid of the most posters, very fun. Uh, word of mouth, very helpful to know a lot of people in this town, uh, to have them share everything, which was really great, uh, very supportive, uh, it was awesome for that. And yeah, the street pop-ups, we would kind of just show up with bubble guns and balloons and music and little parties. Awesome. How we measured our success? Audience numbers. Well, we counted in the middle and at the end of shows. And for each show, we had a crowd of 20 plus participants per show, which was pretty great for kind of a DIY, we're doing it mentality. We have return participants. There are three children I went and taught at King George on Friday with my sister, uh, and they know me as the curly lady. So they <laughs> came up to me, you're the curly lady from the summer. So those three, they kept coming to every show, which was great. Um, and we, on the day of Harbor Fest that we started, we started at Husky the Musky. We invited people to come. They could build their own puppets, and we did a large puppet parade. There was about 35 people that showed up, which was a pretty great number. We started Harbor Fest so pretty well. And these are some of our um, Blurry numbers, but we had, within a month, we had about, I'm gonna say, about 15,000 views and uh, interactions on our different social media pages, mm -hmm. which would count as a win. Mm -hmm. So why support us? Uh, this is more just as an introduction of who we are, what we want to continue to bring uh, to the summer. We want to try and keep it as free or as accessible to all families in Kenora. Uh, it's live theater, different locations in the city. We are willing to go anywhere to bring beautiful art to this town. Uh, it's a weekly event with new content for audiences. So it's a fun challenge for us as artists to kind of create something out of nothing. Always a good time. Still sustainable for creation. We did this all out of my sister's garage. Uh, so we are willing to, that DIY spirit is uh, really alive in us. Uh, and we will draw on tourists. So, if it is a free event, tourists can come, check us out, then they disperse. Go and see a restaurant, and go and spend your money at souvenir shops. That's what we really want to keep people, uh, their money in town, to see the entire experience. That's 12 out of 12. Beautiful. So, uh, we have a few grants in the process right now. We are hoping to hear back from Canada Council for the Arts, uh, as well as Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, and the Kenora, Hos Hospitality Alliance, that's them. Uh, questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> yeah, we gotta have questions on this one. So. <laughs> Your discretion, man. Yeah, yeah normally, we, Jade, normally we don't have questions. True. But we, are, the last we are going to allow them today, and that's Christmas. So, um, so <laughs> yeah, it, it only happens once a year. So. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Moncrief. I really appreciate your energy. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah. 
have you thought about the uh, Lincoln Village Regional Community Foundation as well? They have a spring in too. Yes. For grants. We missed their grant by a day. Oh. Well, they open again in the spring. Yes, they do. Yes. So my, my question was more about how you find the kids to participate. Do you go to where your kids are or do you? I know transportation is a barrier to participation for a lot right. of uh, economically challenged children in particular. So right. Where are you going and can you go where they might be? Absolutely. My, uh, my aunt has a lot of uh, connections out at the reserve. She said there's a lot of people that want to do things but maybe necessarily don't have the means of transport. So we are willing and excited to go anywhere where there are children. We did want to, uh, the, the Rotary Splash Park was important for us because yeah. we thought, well, that's a free kind of space that families can go to. Again, transportation can be a little bit tricky, but it is uh, widely the, available. The Mental Resource Center is really a well-used facility, and then there's things like up downtown now that's also. Yes. So there's some, yeah. Some go between. Yeah, yeah we're, we're continuing to try and build more partnerships where we know, and especially yeah. with, um, uh, we're hoping to come earlier in the spring to try and connect with the schools, uh, to try and get in, do a presentation, and then try and also get audiences from that as well. Thanks for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? No? I know, I'm an intimidating lady. Go ahead. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, well, great. Well, thank um, you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So So next on the agenda John was giving me the gears. Yeah. We're gonna you guys are gonna have to do a compare and contrast yeah. and say, <laughs> at the end of this on <laughs> yeah. So uh, welcome Tim. Uh, uh, from Synergy North. Um, so this is, uh, uh, I believe there was outreach to all the new councillors um, and this is a culmination of having everybody together to uh, hear, uh, uh, hear uh, what Synergy North uh, has going and uh, their connection to our community. So welcome Tim and welcome John, uh, who is our, uh, who is our um, board member and represents the city of Kenora on on the, on the uh, Synergy North board. So welcome, John. Okay. Our, our board chair Gary sends his regrets. His, his uh, calendar didn't permit for him to be here. Um, as the mayor indicated, and as everyone probably did get a request, if they wanted to, to have like a one-on-one -on -one call with me, um, I, that's customary from my perspective to to do that with all new council members that come on. Um, but this is a this is a much better way to probably get it done. That's not to say that my phone is not available if there's a call that needs to come to me that, you know, of course you can call at any time and I'll be glad to take that call. I was unable to attend the orientation sessions that you guys, uh, I understand, went through with all of the city departments as well. So I'm here today to kind of kind of give a, uh, tell my story, I guess, a little bit about the, the company that City of Kenora has ownership in. Um, and so I'll take the time to do that. That's just the table of contents, kind of the, kind of a little bit of the boring where are we going kind of thing. But Synergy North, for those who who don't uh, don't know, so owned in part by City of Kenora and by City of Thunder Bay, um, fifty six thousand customers between the two service territories and about fourteen hundred kilometers of overhead and underground lines. About one hundred and forty employees. That ebbs and flows. In the summer months, we go up a bit um, when we're busy in our construction season, and then that drops a bit, a little bit over the winter. Next slide is, this is just the ownership. So you can kind of see the ownership model. So you can see City of Kenora about 8.31% ownership of Synergy North. And this is just more for your information to see where the structure resides with the City of Thunder Bay. So they hold a hold co, and then the hold co, which they own 100% of, owns the rest of the shares of Synergy North. Hold co also has a couple of other uh, business interests um, that, that are operated out of, uh, out of our offices in Thunder Bay. Renewable power, for those who aren't aware, is the landfill gas generation that happens at the landfill site in Thunder Bay. And utility services is a combination of a few things. Um, the, the, the old Kenora Hydro actually used to be a client or a customer of the services provided from this company, a back office building. That sort of thing. So we still continue to, that company still continues to operate that way. They do locate some metering services. That's just kind of more ancillary information for you, but just to give you an overall idea about how uh, we're kind of structured that way. Next slide. 
is to really, uh, this is the, the process that we went through back in 2020, and this is what's setting the stage for um, what's driving the business that we're doing. So our mission is to provide outstanding energy services in a safe, reliable, uh, and trusted manner um, to our communities in order to empower people's lives. And so we set that as the mission. This was approved by the board back in, 20, um, back in 2020. And coming out of that mission is our vision statement on the next slide, and that's to, to be your trusted partner for energy and related services. So we want to position the company to, um, what I would say is be more prepared for the future, what the future of uh, an electricity distribution utility may look like. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in a few of the other slides. So here's just the process we went through to get to, to arrive at this spot where we had our mission and vision and values. What it led us into was a full-on strategic planning exercise, which I heard a deputation here just a few minutes ago on, on the process that this council is going through. I know the City of Thunder Bay Council is going to go through the same thing. We did this as a utility uh, in late last year, rolling into the spring of, of this year, and then came out with a new drafted three-year strategic plan that the board approved. Coming out of that strategic plan is we have our, uh, a three-year business plan that we're working off of. And what I wanted to do is take the time to kind of highlight for, um, for council here is some of the themes that came out of that strategic planning process. So on the next slide, there's, this, there's a term I, I use on the header that says Fino strategy. And what we're referring to here is what the utility of the future really looks like. So this is a fully integrated network orchestrator. And so historically, the way utilities operated is we're basically relied on to keep the lights on, right? It's in a real, real basic sense. And so when the lights are on, you don't notice us. When the lights are off, you do. And then you want them back on. And so it, 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 it strikes that notion that we react to something, right? So the lights, the power goes out and we react. Um, the utility of the future is not going to be geared that way. We have to prepare for vehicle electrification, whether that's at the residential level, whether it's commercial fleets, for example, at some point, I imagine in the future, is the, the town of Kenora will go down the path of looking at, are we electrifying our, our commercial fleets? Um, you've got you know, your larger commercial customers that, that have multiple vehicles, so we've got to prepare for that. Uh, we're also in the process of preparing for distributed energy resources, so that's this DER acronym, and this, this is the concept or notion of um, customers generating their own electricity behind the meter or having their own battery storage to, to augment that generation behind the meter. And where this really comes from is our, our view going through the strategic planning process is that the customer is going to decide a lot of this. And it's no longer adequate for utilities to wait for that phone call to come to say, well, I want to get X connected or I want to get Y connected, that we need to be there with customers and have the conversation with them to, to ensure that the system is prepared and ready for the future of electrification and whatever that is. So that could be you know, customer-owned generation, battery storage, it could be just expansion of, of operations, things of that nature. Ultimately, what we want to be as a utility is to have the ability to control some of this customer-owned storage and generation because there is benefits to the distribution system for us to have line of sight and access and ability to control some of these loads. And that, if I could give kind of a, a real basic example, it would be uh, if we had a neighborhood that had a sufficient amount of plug-in electric vehicles that perhaps the utility could gain access to on an aggregate level to deal with maybe um, some power supply issues in the neighborhood at a given time. So could we in the future be able to engage with uh, customers to allow us to, to have some sort of control on, on a mutually agreeable basis that benefits both the customer and the utility, the, the system itself. So that's where we're going um, for utility future, that's our concept. So we're going to be spending a little bit of money in, in that direction, I'll talk to that. I think is in probably in the next slide. So not, a, not uh, what I would say is huge dollars in comparison to the, to the size of the budget that, that we work within. Um, but su suffice to say is that some of the things that we're going to be looking at is um, spending a little bit of money for EV support and services, so educational tools. We're going to come out with an EV strategy for customers, so we're going to spend some, some dollars in trying to get our website built up to be able to answer questions about EVs from a customer perspective. 
Um, some of the other things we'll be doing is um, making sure that the grid has the capacity for predicting electrification. So right now we don't know where there might be growth coming down the road in terms of, of, of the system. So it's important for us to be taking the time we say spending money related to activities that may be uh, sitting down with um, construction folks to find out what's what's the latest going on in certain neighborhoods or, or plans that are coming in the future, whether it be a hospital that may be coming to the to the, the town or things of that nature. Just getting down and getting in ahead of it. We'll be doing some transformer proactive monitoring, so we're starting to get more analytics into how we look at the system. And we're also going to be coordinating with the independent electric electricity system operator, which is the organization that controls the supply and live supply and demand of electricity within the province, um, uh, and working with them through something called their local initiatives program. I'm going to talk about that closer to, to the end of, of the presentation because there's some very direct impact for Kenora coming out of that particular topic. The next slide, one of the other things that came out is um, a commitment by the board to ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance, to ensure that how we operate the utility comes through that lens. Um, and so when we talk about environmental, we're talking about reducing our carbon footprint as a utility. Um, it, it may in fact go as far as helping customers reduce their carbon footprint because we, do, we are starting to get calls on how can you assist us to do that. Uh, and so one of the things we'll do personally is we'll look at our fleet electrification. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, reducing office space in Thunder Bay. We're going to be consolidating down into to, uh, a smaller footprint. Uh, in the oil building where we are right now for our office space. Um, on the social side of things, we've, we've instituted a connections committee. It's an employee-like committee. Historically, the, the CEO and the PR person would handle um, community engagement, donations, and things like that. And so I've pushed that out into the hands of an employee group um, where we've set some parameters for them and you know where we can ensure that we're in the communities that we serve and we're going to let the employees take their hand in, in getting more involved in volunteerism and, and on the donation side of things. So I think that's going to be positive. Uh, specifically, right now we're engaged in a bus electrification study with the City of Thunder Bay. We're doing that in concert with Lincoln University, a company called Blue Wave AI, and with some funding from Intercan. And so we're hoping to learn quite a bit out of that process that um, we can use, not just from on a busing perspective, but to provide us insights when we have you know, large commercial customers that have fleet. So it'll help us understand uh, the impact that it's gonna have on you know, various parts of our system. And then of course the customer EV strategy, which, which I mentioned. Um, so I think I spoke to most of these here. Uh, the last bullet point here is, yes, we, are, um, we have ordered an electric F-150 to put into our fleet to start rotating that around. I think we're gonna not see that probably till late summer, early fall. Um, that'll be, <coughs> it'll be our second foray into electric vehicle usage. We, we did have a Nissan Leaf and all electric many years ago when they first came out, had a, a three year lease on that. And to be fair and honest, um, A, employees weren't ready to use it. I, I'll just be frank about it. They, they were frightened to drive it, afraid they were going to run out of gas, run out, run out of electricity. And, and so it, it, was, it was a hard sell to get uh, people involved in trying this technology out. And, and, but we, we did it for a few years. We parked it, shelved it for a while because we just knew that the, you know, we weren't ready, the public wasn't ready. But I think we're ready to get back into it at this point. So we'll be getting a, an F-150 uh, truck. We'll probably use that for, I'll call it late duty. Uh, needs, driving around, appointments with customers, things of that nature. We're hoping to learn um, from that. Uh, the next is, and, and this doesn't necessarily pertain so much um, to Kenora because I believe we're, we're uh, up to where we should be in terms of our forestry strategy here in the town of Kenora. Uh, it was seriously lagging in the city of Thunder Bay, so we're, we're trimming back trees. Um, Quite aggressively, this we're not removing trees; we're trimming them back. We used to just remove trees. We're trimming them back to one meter over the next uh, two years. So by the end of next year, we'll have that taken care of, and then we're going to go on a rolling five-year plan to to maintain within three meters. This will help us with reliability. But the biggest the biggest reason for this is its safety. So uh, there are there are safety standards that require us to maintain within those lines, and up until having. Um, very good objective data through LiDAR mapping. We, we, it was more anecdotal where you're driving looking, 
yeah, we need to trim here, we need to trim there. So we did a flyover and now we've got a really good database that we can maintain. Which is, to, to be frank and honest, how we, um, how we really study the system in general. So our poles and our wires and stuff, we go through a three-year rolling risk assessment process. And we'll get our forestry on that same kind of plan. Um, so that's just the amount that uh, we're spending on that. If you go to the next slide, slide uh, see if there, this is to provide you a snapshot of how we, you know, how much we spend been spending on a capital basis since 2017. We use 2017 in my slide here because, um, and you'll see when we get into our last slide, I'm going to talk about our cost of service application. But that's the last time that we had an approved set of uh, of rates at our at our official five-year rollover. We would typically in Thunder Bay have gone back in in 2022, uh, 2021 for new rates, um, but we did the merge in 2019. So when we filed that mergers acquisitions uh, licensing application with the regulator, we made a decision to push that process out to um, where we'll put in for rates in 2023 for the for the 2024 year. So normally you would have seen a you would have seen us having a reset in, in here, but that's going to come in 2024. So. You know, spending um, spending's been been climbing more or less with with inflation, as as you might expect. Um, and so we're currently sitting at around, and I shouldn't say proposed. The board approved this just a couple of weeks ago. The 2023 amount sitting at around 14 million dollars in capital spending for for next year. That top line, the black line, is really to indicate when we go into that cost of service process and we make application to the Ontario Energy Board for our rates we have to support it with a very detailed distribution system plan. And this line represents where we would have been spending if we did everything in the plan. You see this drop in 2020, and that was for us to pull back on cash because of COVID, not knowing what the impact would be on our revenue side. So we made a decision to pull back on capital spending just to ensure we didn't uh, put ourselves in, in, a, in an awkward financial position if uh, revenues really dropped off during the period of COVID. So I did want to talk briefly about past local investments. So since uh, since we've merged, um, there's been about $4.75 million of capital investments here in Kenora. A lot of it driven by the connection of broadband through T-Baytel um, and other communication companies for that matter. And 110 new services, uh, both residential and commercial. And of course, the big one being uh, relocation, Shipman Street and 3rd Street. and as I, as I understand, there'll be some, some future downtown work that is coming around the corner. We did take the time to get uh, the, the infrastructure here from a PCB perspective um, within the, uh, the legal guidelines that, that are in place. So that is, that is good, we've completed that. The next slide is 2023 local investments. So we're planning on spending about 580,000 capital here in Kenora this year. Um, largely going to be spent on, on some transformers and switches and, and poles. When I talk about it, it's based on condition assessment, that's that three-year renewal plan that we go on. And so that's what is up and due for this year. Uh, general services, we do about five new per year. When you say general service, that's you know, your, 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 commercial, uh, your commercial customers. This is just kind of a more of an information piece on how it gets uh, broken down so you can see the Kenora portion in there. 2024, um, we, can, we, we anticipate we're going to spend about the same amount in 2024 that we did in 2023. Um, we do continue to be approached. There seems to be lots of talk of activity in Kenora, and, and so we, we keep our ear to the ground and uh, answering calls that come in from, from developers on, on possibilities here in, in the town, and that's good news. Um, if there's not that kind of churn in phone calls, then I start to get a little bit nervous that you know what's going on but we're still getting calls so I, I feel positive um, about the future activity here in, in Kenora. We will be doing some work in the Kenora substation um, and that's just going to be some insulator replacements. Beyond 2024 and this is where I wanted to talk a little bit about this um, work with the independent electricity system operator on their local initiatives program. So. We've been in conversation with the independent electricity system operator uh, in that the, the substation in, a, in the yard uh, has been identified as reaching capacity in around 2029. So with the amount of new load that's coming on, that station will be maxed out. 
And so we have to start now um, trying to figure out what the plan is going to be for post-2029. And we're working with the system operator to kind of determine, um, I won't say, I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to say what's the lowest cost alternative, but that's a big part of um, the decision making process. Historically, what utilities would do or Hydro One would do is like, oh, we just need to put another big transformer in there. That's the answer because that's what we know and that's what we're good at and that's what we do. But that's, that thinking started to change about 10 years ago where we now start to evaluate things like conservation and demand management programming. So can we, can we put some programs in place that would get customers to reduce load for a while so we can defer spending that money on a new transformer? Uh, when we look at battery storage, that would allow us to, when we hit a real peak moment, we could draw on the batteries to supply power to the area. So we're going to look at a number of alternatives and it's going to come with some consultations with the public when we start getting into it a little further. News Transformer obviously always remains a potential viable option. So that will be coming um, up in conversation in, the, in probably not so much of this year, but yeah, beyond 2024 and into 2025. Um, these things, um, this kind of work takes a long lead time. Um, and so we'll make sure we get it, get it right for Kenora on that piece. I want to talk a little bit about local presence. Um, most may not be aware, but the original plan and the unanimous shareholders agreement was to maintain an operations center here, which, which we do. Um, but we also now house uh, our regulatory group. So our, our, regu our regulatory folks are the ones that deal with governmental policy and all our, all our filings with the regulator, uh, making sure that we're on site with the, all the rules that we're supposed to be following. And we used to have uh, three individuals um, involved in that, in that process. And based out of, originally two out of, of Thunder Bay, and when, when we did the merge, um, most of me in the room, you know, Janice. Janice became our manager of a regulatory group from Kenora, so she managed a couple of employees in Thunder Bay. Um, we're at the stage now where we've added on an additional resource here, um, and I don't have any regulatory staff in Thunder Bay anymore, so they're, they're here for now, which I think is a good news story. Um, you know, when we, when we first did the merge, we wondered, you know, could we, could we do this kind of work uh, from afar um, and manage, you know, remote work locations? And we found that we can do that. And then COVID really kind of solidified that it's not as hard as uh, people think it is to do. Um, we're going to continue to be part of the community here. So you see some of the things that we've donated to in the past. Uh, coming up this year for our e-billing campaign to get customers on electronic billing format will be Meals on Wheels. Um, and that was um, a decision made by the Connections Committee. Just a, a reminder for those um, new on council, the next, uh, next slide here is there was an agreement made between Synergy North and, and the town of Kenora for uh, debt repayment. So we did a $500,000 chunk of principal repayment uh, last June and we'll continue to, to do that over the coming five years till we settle off the, uh, the debt on the books. Um, and it'll take us about five more payments to, to complete that. So just wanted to uh, be clear that that will continue. Um, if I advance a couple more slides, to be clear. And to on the cost of service one here. So I just wanted to kind of close off to let you know that we're at our cost of service period, which I said is every five years. Kenora, uh, Kenora Hydro hadn't done one for about 11 years. So it's been, it's been a long time coming <coughs> for um, kind of a rate resetting by customer class, and that's really what the process uh, takes care of. Um, I've been taking a, a, a budget to the Synergy North Board of Directors. Um, your, your rep will be seeing that uh, come mid-January, and they'll be, that's way early to be approving a budget, uh, a 2024 budget, but we have to do that in order to have that in place for the application process. We will go out to customers in quite soon after that to, to engage with them in a survey, to talk to them about the bill impacts of the application. We've already gone out to them once previously, a few months back, to talk about some of the components of our spending. This is where we attach costs to it, so they can give some direct in input back to us on, on that piece. Um, we'll file for that in August, and we expect we'll go through the, the process with the Ontario Energy Board and have rates in place for May 1st of May 2024. Just a little footnote on here. To do an application these days with the regulator costs it's going to cost about six or seven hundred thousand dollars, not including internal staff time. It's a very expensive process. 
um, it's quasi-judicial and you go through your, like you would through any kind of an insurance claim, I suppose, through, through the judiciary discovery period and, and all that fun stuff. So that's, um, I just wanted to, again, thank, thank Council for having us here. I think it's, uh, I think I'm happy to say we're well positioned with the new strategic plan. Um, we're preparing for electrification and those distributed energy resources. Um, customer focus is going to be a top of mind and we believe we're building a resilient uh, system out there. I know questions are not customary at deputation. We will have some questions today. <laughs> uh, Councillor Koch. Um, is there any, is it, is it on your radar at all to expand Synergy North Service where fiber one customers exist within city limits? Uh, we're always open for those conversations. I, I think it's probably fair to say that the other party probably wouldn't be interested mm -hmm. in giving up customers, okay. but that's that's a constant, particularly here, and, and you should hear it out in Ottawa, where where the city of Ottawa has grown to the point where they've surrounded a, a quite a chunk of hydro and customer uh, service territory. But I would always be open for that conversation. I, it, it, it has come up in the past, and I'm sure it'll come up in the, I'll, I'll continue to, to raise it, I guess, and we'll see where it catches any, uh, any, any uh, traction at all. Any other questions, Council? No? Well, um, on behalf of Council, Tim, uh, thanks for attending and uh, wish you all the best uh, over the holidays and look forward to our working relationship in 2023. Yeah. Appreciate it. I brought copies of the strategic plan here, so okay. I can leave those behind Great. for folks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Seven additions to the agenda. We have the Coper Road Geotechnical Investigation and Analysis Financial Commitment. Uh, so we have resolution number two. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Resolu resolution number two. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Moncrief, that approval be hereby given for the following additional items to be added to today's agenda and discussed by Council Coper Road Geotechnical Investigation and Analysis Financial Commitment. Any questions of council? No? Uh, do you want to call for the vote on that one? Pardon? Call for the vote. Call for that, yeah. going to. Um, so now I'd like to uh, call for the vote. All in favor? Okay. Opposed? Okay. Uh, okay, we have uh, resolution 2A. Thank you, Your Worship. Resolution number 2A, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Moncrief, that Council hereby commits $55,600 55, $55, plus HST to the 2023 Municipal Capital Budget in advance of the 2023 budget approval for the Coker Road geotechnical work, which is required to proceed in advance of the budget approval. Any discussion of Council? No. Um, okay, uh, call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, resolution uh, number three um, uh, appointments. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Be resolved that Council hereby appoints Rebecca Weinberg to the Board of Health for the Northwestern Health Unit Board for a term at the pleasure of Council no later than November 14, 2026. Uh, all those Move in favor. By me, sorry, seconded oh, okay. by Thank you. Chase. Thank you. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, resolution number four. Oh. Look, Mark has resolution. Oh. 
assumption that she's not here. <laughs> that council hereby appoints Chad English to the Accessibility Advisory Committee for a term of the pleasure of council in the late event November 14, 2026. Sorry, sorry. I was going to call the vote, but <laughs> it looks like... I have no question. Okay, uh, so uh, we'll call the vote then. All in favor? Okay, carried. Thank you. Look at this improvisation a month in. It's like we've been doing it. Yeah. Um, Moving on the uh, agenda to uh, item number nine, reports from the Committee of the Whole. Uh, we have uh, 9.1 corporate services, so we have resolution number five. Resolution number five, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Burney. That council gives three readings to bylaw to adopt an amended rules of order and procedures for the <coughs> Council of the City of Kenora, and further that council hereby accepts the 2023 council meeting calendar as presented. And further, that in accordance with bylaw number 144-2007, public notice is hereby given that council intends to establish their 2023 meeting calendar and amend the procedural bylaw. And further, that bylaw number 102-2022 be hereby repealed. Thank you. Um, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Uh, <coughs> against? Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Resolution number six, please. Uh, resolution number six, that council gives three readings to adopt a new bylaw with respect to policies to the provision of public notice. And further, that in accordance with public notices bylaw 144-2007, public notice is hereby given that council intends to adopt a new pu public notices bylaw at its December 20th, 22 meeting and further that bylaw number 144-2007 be hereby repealed. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Chase. Uh, any discussion? No. Uh, call the vote. All in favor? Votes. Carried. Thank you. Uh, resolution number seven. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I move resolution number seven, and it's seconded by Councillor Moncrief, that three readings be given to bylaw to authorize a contract extension agreement with First Student Transit Canada for the operation of city, pardon me, for the operation of the city's conventional transit system ending December 31st, 2023, and further that all other terms and conditions of the original agreement outlined in bylaw number 161-2017 remain in force and effect. Any discussion? I'll call the vote. All in favor? carried. Thank you. Uh, moving on to resolution number eight, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I would ask that we table this motion for the time being. Okay. Um, okay, so I need a seconder for a motion to table. Second. No. Okay, so I need clarification on whether you would like to set a date for it to return or if you'd like it to be left open. Left. Thank you. Uh, left open, Your Worship. Okay. okay. Um, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, those carried. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, moving under 9.4 community services, uh, we have resolution number nine. Thank you, Your Worship, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Chase. The Council hereby authorize a funding application to the Ontario Trillium Foundation under its Resilient Communities Fund by the Muse. Uh, any discussion? No. Uh, all those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, resolution uh, number 10, please. Uh, resolution number 10, moved by myself and seconded by uh, Councillor Koch. That Council approves an application to FedNor in the amount of $270,000 for the delivery of an investment attraction strategy and implementation project. And further, that Council confirms its financial commitment of up to $30,000 for the project to be funded through municipal accommodation tax revenues. And further, that Council hereby approves any cost overruns associated with this project. Any discussions? Uh, call the vote, please. Carried. Thank you. 
Uh, moving on to resolution number 11, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I move <clears throat> resolution number 11, seconded by Councillor Chase, that Council hereby approves the application for zoning bylaw amendment file number D14 22 07 to change the zoning of the subject property from R1 residential first density zone to R2 residential second density zone, and further that Council gives three readings to a bylaw to that effect. Any discussion? Uh, call the vote, please. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, moving on, item or resolution number 12, please. Resolution number 12, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Chase. That Council gives three readings to a bylaw to adopt a new Council CAO covenant policy, number CC 1 1, which forms part of the City's comprehensive policy manual to reflect the new 2022 2026 term of Council. And further, that bylaw number 96 2021 be hereby repealed. Any discussion? <coughs> I'll call the vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, resolution number 13, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I move resolution number 13, and it's seconded by Councillor Bernie. The Council gives three readings to bylaw to appoint David Pratt as the Fire Chief and the Community Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Kenora, and further that bylaw number 70 2021, bylaw 38 2022, and bylaw 34 2022 uh, be hereby repealed. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? I'll call the vote, please. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, resolution number 14, please. Resolution number 14, Your Worship, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Chase, that Council hereby appoints Brian Marsh to the position of Treasurer for the City of Kenora, and further that bylaw number 114-2022 and 76-2010 be he hereby repealed. Any discussion? Uh, I'll call the vote then. All in favour? Carried. Thank you. Uh, resolution number 15, please. Thank you. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Council of Chase, the Council of the City Kenora, accept the September and October 2022 Kenora Water and Wastewater Systems Monthly Summary Report as prepared by administration. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Councilor Van Bellen? No? Thank you, Your Worship. I was wondering if um, we get this detailed of a report in this department, it's um, very operationally heavy because of the Walkerton um, decision, or is this, like, is that standard for, it just seems very detailed and robust for this, for this level. And so I was wondering if we could get a little bit more clarification as to. Would you like to, <laughs> would you like to? And then if so, I do a follow-up okay. question to that, if that's okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah, I guess uh, a lot of the uh, decision making on what makes it to council has evolved from Walkerton. Uh, obviously, as part of the water, um, what's the act? Safe Water Drinking, Safe water Safe drinking water. Act. <laughs> council needs to be informed about certain things about the system. So, uh, in order to uh, create a report, I guess, to satisfy that purpose, there are other uh, things coming forth to council in the new year in terms of uh, the drinking water quality management system sign off and whatnot. But uh, this was provided on an ongoing basis for council to keep aware and abreast of certain operational uh, things happening within the system. Like you said, it's quite heavy in terms of keeping council up to date on what's happening with the sewer and water system, being it's a standalone utility. So. Um, I think previous councils ha had requested that type of information to come to council. Mm -hmm. If it needs to be paired back, we can do that too. Um, it really depends on council's level of comfort on what they want to kind of see in terms of, of the information shared for that department. Okay. Uh, something. May I? Uh, th thank you for that. Um, my follow up to that would be I see some trends in the um, influent effluent flows between water and wastewater. Some are up year over versus down. And I wonder if this is something that we are tracking or are these trends m mean anything to us at this level? Not at the council level. I, I suppose uh, there are seasonal and cyclic uh, water plant and sewage plant issues. Um, obviously, when there's heavy rains and whatnot in the summer, the sewage plant sees a little bit more infiltration going towards it. Um, I, I would say there's no real 
uh, concern for the fluctuations. It's usually due to weather or certain consumption factors during any course of the year in terms of seasonal uh, averages of, of being higher or lower than the average. Um, as I mentioned in the previous uh, report to Council on, on this specific department, we're well within our ranges of, of the plant capacity, so there's no concerns there. And there hasn't been any um, uh, concerns on effluent going out of the sewage plant that hasn't met uh, you know, the various federal and provincial requirements for, for release into the Winnipeg River system. So, um, you know, if you're looking for that kind of information, I'd have to go back and, and, and resource, you know, and look at, this, at the various uh, data put into that report on why certain fluctuations may be there or not. Uh, in some cases, the water plant might be pumping out a little bit more water than usual if there's a major uh, water break that month or some, something to that effect. So there are certain things that we have to look at and, and uh, do some review on if we're really to drill down to find out why there's cyclic you know, changes in that data for those plants. Thank you, Director Bumper. Thank you, Your Worship. Any other questions of Council? No? Okay, uh, call the vote then. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, resolution number 16, please. Resolution number 16, moved by myself and second by Councillor Koch, that uh, the Mayor and Clerk be hereby authorized to execute the following agreements on behalf of the Corporation of the City of Kenora. Funding Agreement, Ministry Tourism, Culture and Sport, Canada Day Funding. Funding Agreement Amendment, Minister, Minister of uh, Infrastructure, Recreation Centre Rehabilitation Project. NOF, uh, NOHFC Funding Agreement Amendment, uh, Lake of the Woods Museum, Date Changes that three readings be given to bylaws for this purpose. Uh, any questions? Uh, Councillor Van Loon. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a, just a question in regards to the funding amount for the rec center rehabilitation. So I'm going to page. I think it's just a typo. For, it's sort of reading as like $4 billion. But I, I think it's just an extra. Yeah. Yeah, it was four point nine million nine 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 million. Did I put an extra number in there? It's four it, well, million. It's just it's a period number. Okay. It's oh, no, I apologize. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Councilor Van Lundt. So we'll go. We'll uh, take a look at that. So <laughs> it's, it, I, I can assure you, it's not billion. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, call the vote, please. All in favor. Carried, thank you. Okay, uh, resolution number 17, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Resolution number 17, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Chase, that the following bylaws be now read <coughs> first and second time and approved in their present form and presented for third and final reading. Number 156-2022 confirmatory, 157-2022 procedural bylaw, 158-2022. Conventional Transit Contract Extension for Student Canada. 159 2022 Council CAO Covenant Policy Number CC 1 1 1. Uh, 160 2022 Public Notices Bylaw 161 2022 C14 2207 Zoning Bylaw Amendment to Airy, Nels Airy to Nelson Street. Um, 162 2022 Fire Chief and CEMC appointment, 163 2022 Treasurer appointment, 164 2022 Funding Agreement Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport Canada Day Funding, 165 2022 Funding Agreement Amendment, <coughs> Minister of Inter Infrastructure, Recreation Centre Rehabilitation Project, and 166 2022 NOHFC Funding Agreement for Lake of the Woods Museum. Okay, uh, call, the, uh, call the vote, please. Favor. Thank you. Um, so now uh, moving on to item uh, number 15. So I, I'm not sure if new councillors are aware of that, but at the end of the regular session of council, uh, there's an opportunity for each councillor to um, have an opportunity to uh, <coughs> speak. So um, I'll start with Councillor Moncrief. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Councillor Van Bellingham. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I wanted to 
take some time in recognition of the new addition being built at the Sportsplex. I want to start by saying thank you to all the staff, the volunteers, the board of the Sportsplex, and our provincial partners for all the work funding, saving, and labor put into bringing this to fruition. I want to say a special thank you to Megan Darward, Jennifer Finley, and Heather Pila for all your work. You all do so much for this community, and I know this is just one of the many things you've all accomplished to make our community better, and I am deeply grateful. I also hope that these product, with these projects moving forward, we can do a better job of acknowledging and communicating them to the community in a more inclusive way. This will have a big impact on our community, and I can't wait for more details and construction to begin. Thank you to everyone involved. Can I see two more? I'll keep them quick. Okay. <laughs> um, I also want to. I don't think we have a limit. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I also want to take a moment, moment to recognize all the work being done to support um, the the Kanor Sports Ukraine project, um, supporting the new migrants from Ukraine in the Kanor region. This community has done an incredible job of arranging funds, housing, and support to integrate into this community. Thank you for showing us how welcoming Kanor can be. And my last one, um, the Kenora Youth Hub hosted an open house a few weeks ago, which I was privileged enough to attend. They took us through the physical space, which I promise you when I say this, the outside does not do the space justice. Um, they have in-house mental and physical health supports, some which are contracted out and some are permanent. They have an incredible basement space with games, crafts, art supplies, a small cooking space, and they run laundry services through a contract and teach life skills. They also offer food donations for youth. Sorry, this is a little, anyways. Um, both those who have access to cooking spaces, as well as youth who do not, in which they offer nutritionally dense food to go items. Sorry. Um, from January 2021 to March 2022, the Youth Hub has welcomed 182 new youth into the space and hosted 949 activities. They collaborate land-based activities with Right to Play and offer daily educational support and walk-in counseling. I barely scratched the surface with everything this organization offers to youth, including harm reduction, and always meeting youth where they are at. They have a Youth Advisory Council, which is a fundamental part of their governance structure and something I hope this council will look to integrate into our upcoming term. Thank you to everyone involved in bringing this to fruition in Kenora. I look forward to supporting proactive, inclusive programs like this in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a few words. Uh, the, the city of Kenora, like many private business owners, private residents, uh, struggle with you know, the issues of addictions and homelessness and needles on their property. And a few weeks ago, um, after the issue of needles being found at Central Community Club came into the public, um, it really gave me some chance to reflect and, and sort of, I, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the city, but as a counselor, I, I really want the public to know, um, as a counselor, we take this issue very seriously. And we're gonna be working very hard in the next four years, especially sooner than later in our term to try to address these issues and bring stakeholders together, partners together, but also encourage members of the public to get involved and be involved in this because it's everyone's problem. It's not gonna be as simple as passing the buck and blaming the city or blaming a contractor or blaming an addict. So we really need to find creative solutions for this problem. It's not unique to Kenora. It's obviously a glaring problem in Kenora because of how small our community is and how quickly stuff spreads in social media. But I think we can all do better at, at trying to bring people together to solve these problems and work together. And I, for one, as a counselor, wanna make that very clear. It's a big priority of mine. And it's a big priority, I think, of this group to try to solve some of these problems together. Um, so I just wanted to bring that uh, bring that forward today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Trace. Uh, Councillor Koch. Gosh, I'm uh, with Councillor Moncrief here today. <laughs> Got nothing to offer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Murray. Well, um, yeah. I guess I just want to uh, wish everybody Merry Christmas and um, best of the season. And I uh, I just want to echo uh, Councillor Chase's words, um, talking about our issues in the community. Um, and I think our way, and I know our way forward is through our community safety and well-being plan. And um, I, I really look forward to uh, working more on this and developing it, um, doing community consultation because I agree, Councilor Chase, this is everyone's issue, and everybody has to have a seat at the table and and be part of the solution. So I'm very optimistic. This it, this is our way forward. Um, I know there's an appetite. Uh, um, 
you know, this, this council, uh, Mayor Poirier has an appetite, or uh, the senior leadership team has an appetite to move this forward. So I'm optimistic that we will be able to move this forward in the new year and, uh, and bring those community partners together through our community safety and well-being plan. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Bernie. Um, so um, I, I guess I get to play either Santa Claus or the Elf. I'm not sure <laughs> what it is today, but uh, just uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the, myself and the rest of the council, and that we uh, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to take uh, I'm not going to take credit for the idea. It was uh, uh, Councillor Koch and, and Councillor. Uh, Moncrief, uh, but what we would like to do today is acknowledge uh, senior leadership that is here today, and that doesn't include you, Eric. Oh. We don't have one for you. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to do, and, and Heather, I didn't know you were going to be here, so I, I okay. already handed that out. So um, and the only thing is, is you can't start eating it. Uh, uh, during the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so on behalf, of, on behalf of us, thank you for all the work you do. Uh, I know we've been pressing you over the last seven or eight weeks, um, but um, uh, we rely on your expertise, and we will continue in 2023 and beyond till the end of the term. So thank you very much, and enjoy, please. Thank you. Couldn't do it without the team. We got a solid team. So that's great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mark will get shut up if you like. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank Brian's coming back and he missed his appointment. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> Should I leave it with him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I know I've said it a couple times, but, uh, um, you know, uh, Merry Christmas and all the best to not only uh, council and your families, uh, but also uh, to the citizens of Kenora um, and visitors to the region uh, during the holiday season. Uh, welcome, uh, enjoy your holidays, enjoy your downtime, um, because, you know, and what's the saying in that? We're gonna hit the ground running in, you know, January 2nd of 2023 again. And I think it's gonna be a, a, a very full year, uh, 2023 and that. So, um, Relax, rest, and enjoy your family and friends. Thank you very much. Um, resolution number uh, 18, please. This is moving. Yet to go okay. to close. Resolution number 18, moved by myself and second by Councilor Chase, that pursuant to section 239 of the Municipal Act 2001, as amended, authorization for council to move into a close, closed session at 1.22 p.m. to discuss items pertaining to the uh, following. Number one, education and training members of council. Three matters, CAO and mayor updates, MP Eric Malalo briefing. And number two, labor relations. Uh, one, matter vacancies, service levels. Okay, uh, all those in favor? Carried. Thank you very much.
All in favor. Sorry, that's yours. <laughs> So thank you. Um, so we're moving on to item number 17, uh, adjournment of the meeting. Okay. Uh, and there should be a resolution. I've got the resolution, Your Worship. Um, it's seconded by Councillor Bernie that this meeting now to be declared closed at 4.10 p.m. All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> thank you very much.